everyone. Today I'm going to be going through how to make this sampler macrame piece. It's going to use absolutely all of the sort of standard basic macrame techniques um, all in one cute little wall hanging piece. I'm going to be using one of our hand dyed macrame kits. Um, you can order them from our website or if you have some macrame supplies of your own you're welcome to follow along um, with what you are doing. But our website if you would like to get one of our hand dyed samples um, here all as a kit ready to go is nomadyarnshop.com and that link will be down below. Um, so let's go ahead and get started um, with the very basics. I'm going to start with this bright colored one um, just because it reminds me of the spring flowers that are blooming right now. Um, so once you, the materials that you are going to need for this are, and again, if you've got our kit, it has all of those materials in there. Um, but it's going to be it's going to be <clears throat> four 60 inch long pieces in one color four 60 inch long pieces in a second color, and then two 60 inch long pieces in a third color. So all of them are the same length, um, and you're just going to have the four, four, and two. You can do this all in one color, so all in a white or whatever other color you've got, um, but you're gonna get the color effect if you do it the way that I'm, um, I'm talking about it here. So the first thing that we're gonna wanna do is we are going to start on the outside. The first knot that we're gonna be going through today is one of the very, very basics with, <clears throat> um, with macrame, and that is going to be the lark's head. That's how we're going to put the, <clears throat> that's how we're gonna be putting the strands onto the dowel um, or whatever the, the hanging stick that you've got that you're going to be using. Um, so we're going to go through how to do the lark's head and then we're actually going to put all of those on. Okay, so now that we're going through how to do the lark's head, I'm actually going to be with the hands cam here so you can see exactly what I'm doing. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to be using the, if you're doing the kits from us, you're going to be using the color that has just the two strands. We are gonna take one of those strands, we are going to fold it in half and trace it down until you get to the center. And then we're gonna take that center, we are going to lay it across our dowel that we're working on. You're gonna go across, and then you're going to pull the loops through, or pull the two tails through that loop that we created with the bite that is the center point. We just pull that and go all the way through. And that is our lark's head. I do wanna point out it looks different on one side than on the other side. One of these is technically the lark's head and one of them is the reverse lark's head. Um, and it is up to you which one you think is the right side, like the pretty side that you're gonna be looking at. The only thing that matters is that you put all of your strands on the same way. So they're, they either all look like this or they all look like this. To me, I prefer the look of the no bump. So to me, there's no bump on this one versus there's the bump on the other side, but it should be whatever you prefer. So we've got those two on one side, and then we're going to do that exact same thing with the second strand of that color. Um, so we fold it in half, we find the middle, we are going to lay that across, and you've got kind of two ways to tie your lark's head. You can put your loop across and pull these through, but that is going to put the bump on the front side, the side that you're looking on, looking at. So since I want them all the same, I don't want that bump on the side that's facing me because then it won't match the other one. So I want to actually take that loop and put it behind my dowel and then reach through that loop and pull and that is going to make our lark's head that faces that same direction. And to do with, with this color setup, you want one of the strands, when you tie it on, it now looks like there's two strands. Um, so we've got our two strands of the color on one side and two strands of the color on the other side. Now we are going to grab our second color. So this one 
and you get to choose what order you want your colors to be in but I kind of designed them assuming you were going to go from the brightest color so this is like a bright um, a bright pink and then this one is more of a bright orange the colors are more true on the face cam rather than the hand cam just with the lighting um, and then the lightest one in the center so that's how I set it up but you get to choose um, if you're doing multicolored ones which one you want them to go with and we are going to attach the colors in for the next one as well. We do, uh, to do our hand dyeing, we do uh, secure the ends together so they don't get all mixed up and wiggled around in the dyeing process. And so that's what I'm taking off is just how they are secured um, at the end. And some of, these, <laughs> some of these come off easier than others. There we go. <clears throat> So we are going to do the same thing with these. We're going to take one strand at a time. We're going to put the two ends together, trace it down to find the middle. And I am going to do a few more Lark's heads here with you so that you can see how that works. If you're looking at the side that has the bumps on it, you are going to want to take your uh, loop there that's the middle, lay it over the top and pull that. <clears throat> pull those two tails through and that's going to put a bump on the same side. If you are looking at the side that does not have the bump, I'll grab my two ends here. You are going to go underneath that dowel, pull the strands through and pull it up. So they both create the lark's head. That's just which side is the bump on is all you're doing. Um, and it doesn't matter which one you go to. I would probably recommend pick one style and do them all that way. Um, it's just gonna be a little bit easier for um, to kind of keep track of what you're doing. So underneath goes over the top of the dowel and pull the two ends through. And then the last one, find the center, go underneath pull the ends through. So we have we have two of our three colors finished. We are going to do that exact same thing for the last color, putting it in the middle. So now that we have all of our Lark's head completed and we have everything laying like this, um, everything is secured to the dowel here at the top. Now it's time to just make sure everything looks neat and tidy. All of the um, all of the cords are sitting neatly against each other, and I'm just pulling on each cord individually to make sure that everything is is tight on there. We want to make sure that these are tight, tightly secured on there, so they're not wiggling around, and they just look nice and neat and tidy as we go. I also, if you're getting your kits from from us. We also include a couple of little rubber bands um, and I personally like to take my little rubber bands um, and put them around the ends just so that I feel really confident as I'm doing all of my macrame work here. I feel really confident that nothing is gonna fall off of the edges with that. So they're kind of secured on there. And smushing them closer together so they're into the center also makes things look more neat and tidy so that you're ready to get started again. You can also, if you find it easier to work with um, your macrame piece if it is hanging, so you'll see this one um, has a hanger on it, you can just take a, um, your kit will come with a, an undyed cord that you can use for the cord, um, or you can use any um, yarn twine string that you've got around. You can just, just tie quickly, attach something onto the outer edges. And when you're finished with the whole piece, we can, we can put on a more decorative um, looking tie. But if you prefer to work your macrame piece, while it's hanging up in the air, which a lot of people do find that easier to work with. Um, that is a, an option that you can go ahead and attach to that string right now. Um, I find it easier to do the Lark's head to attach everything on originally when it's flat. But from this point on, if you find it easier to work with your macrame pieces hanging, um, feel free to just tie your two edges up right now. 
So the next stitch that we are going to be going over in this macrame sampler is the square knot. So you can see in my finished sample here, these that I'm pointing out right now are the square knots. Um, and that is what the body of this, um, of this piece is going to be made from is those square knots. This is a very straightforward knot. It's not going to be a hard one for us to get through. Um, and it's going to be a foundational knot in macrame. Uh, pretty much all macrame patterns are going to have you do square knots in them at some point. So we let's get started going through how to do the square knot. So what we are going to do is you're going to want to refer to your pattern about where you're putting your square knots. Um, and if you do have our kit, it does come with our full pattern that has every step um, with the with the written out instructions as well. But generally macrame patterns are going to tell you you are going to do a square knot using these strands. These cords um, are going to be the ones that you're tying a square knot with. So this piece starts by tying a square knot with strands one, two, three, and four. And macrame strands are always labeled that way. They always start on the left-hand side with cord number one, and they just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until you run out of cords that go all the way across there. Um, and so we are gonna be tying our square knot with these two cords. And to do a square knot, there are kind of two, <clears throat> two main steps that we're gonna be doing. So, or two sort of stages of the, of the stitch. So the first stage, we are going to be using mostly strands one and four. I'm gonna push all these other strands all the way out of the way. And I actually do this a lot while I'm truly working my piece as well. Um, I just get everybody else out of the way so I don't, I'm not confused about what I'm supposed to be working with. Um, and we are going to be working with, for a slip, uh, square knot, we're going to be working with cord one and cord four, and the two cords in the middle, cords two and three, are what's called filler cords. We're not actually going to see these, we're not really going to be doing anything with these. These are just making our square knots thicker in the center. Um, so those are basically just going to stand straight down and we're not going to do anything with them. Um, for step one of our square knot, we are going to take our uh, cord number one. We're gonna bring it over the front, across all of them, or across stitch, across strands two and three. And then we're going to put strand four over the top of strand one. So we take strand one and we go in front of strand two and three, and then underneath strand four. And now we're going to take strand four and we're gonna tuck it underneath strands two and three and bring it out over the top of strand one. So I'm gonna take strand four and bring it underneath strand three and strand two and over the top of strand one. So that is a square knot, or that's the first stage of our square knot. Now we want to tighten that up, and don't worry, I will go over that several more times if that didn't uh, click perfectly for you this very first time. So that was step one of our square knot. Now, when you're numbering the cords in macrame, they are always numbered one, two, three, and four. It doesn't matter that this one didn't start off as strand one at the beginning of this square knot. This is now strand one. So we are going to still be referring to them as one, two, three, and four. Um, otherwise, as our strands in macrame move around our piece, if you were to keep track of where did that strand that's now at the front, where did that start at the very beginning of the piece, it would quickly become incredibly confusing. Um, so generally, while you're, um, anytime it's referring to a number of a strand, it always starts fresh with strand one, um, is the one of the farthest to the left, and they just go in numerical order. No matter where they started at the beginning of the piece, that's always where they are. Um, so this time, we are going to pick up strand four first. We're gonna bring strand four across strand three and two, across over the front of, and then we're going to bring it underneath strand one. There's always a lot of 
cord or strand management um, as you're doing this where you've kind of got to keep everything straight and that's fine. Um, so strand four went over the top of strand three and strand two and it went underneath strand one. Now we're going to take strand one and go behind strands two and three and over the top of strand four. Just like that. That is the second part of our slip of our square knot. And we are just going to tighten that up. And I personally prefer to work my macrame with kind of making things as, as tight as I can, um, or at least snug where I'm pulling pretty, pretty enthusiastically there. Uh, maybe not white knuckle pulling, but pretty firmly pull. Um, to me, it's easier to maintain my tension that way because I'm just kind of pulling tight. Um, rather than leaving them a little bit looser where it can be harder to judge um, how tight or how loose each piece should be. So that was our first square knot. I'm going to go ahead and walk through the same process again for our second square knot. Walk through it slowly um, and talk through each step so that if you didn't catch it quite perfectly the very first time, it's you've got time to check it out again. So this time our pattern is telling us that this square knot should be using the four strands that are five, six, seven, and eight. So I'm ignoring strands one through four because that's not what we're working with right now and I'm ignoring all these strands so that all I've got in front of me is the four strands I'm gonna be using for this square knot. So in our first stage, we take strand number one, and we go over the top of, I'm sorry, strand number five, and we go over the top of strand six and strand seven and we go underneath strand eight. We'll pull that out so we've got that has happened. And now I'm gonna take strand eight and I'm going to go underneath strand seven and six and over the top of strand five. So this is identical to what we did the last time, just with different strands. So that's our first stage of that knot. I'm gonna pull that up, make it pretty tight. And you'll notice I'm pulling on these filler cords just to make sure you don't want to see those cords through, um, kind of through there. You want them to be um, sort of pop, pulled down uh, fully through there. It makes it just makes it nicer looking with your square knot um, to be snugged up around them. So that was the first step of our square knot. Second step, we are going to take strand eight. We are going to go across strand seven and six and underneath strand five and then we are gonna take strand five and we are gonna go underneath strand six and seven and over the top of strand eight. So that is the second part of our square knot. I'm gonna pull that tight and again, pull down on our filler cords to make that nice and neat and tidy. And you can tell our two square knots look the same as each other. That's a square knot. This particular pattern is gonna have you work a lot of square knots. Um, so you will get a lot of chance to practice. If they don't look perfect the very first time you've ever done them, that's okay, they're not supposed to. It's what learning new things is supposed to be like. Um, you will get better the more you do it. And this particular piece gives you a lot of opportunities to practice. Um, so we are going to be you work a square knot all the way across the, the first four, then the next four, then the next four, then the next four, then the next four, all the way across. And then we're gonna be working um, them not, not in exactly the same way. So we're gonna come into in two strands and then work them again, um, work, work them offset. So you can see this square knot is not directly below it, it's off to the side there. Um, so let me go ahead and do that for you now. Okay, so we've done square knots all the way across all of our um, cords for the first row. Now we are going to be starting our second row of square knots. And for this row, on this particular sampler, the pattern tells us that we are not going to be doing them with cords one and two. So I'm just gonna put those out of the way. It's telling us we're gonna be doing our square knot, so the exact same thing we already know how to do, but we're gonna be doing it with cord three, four, five, and six. So I'm gonna put the rest of them 
out of the way. So I've got these four are the ones that I'm gonna be using. And I'm gonna tie my square knot with these four. And then the pattern tells me the next square knot is gonna be with these four. So you can see these were our square knots for the first row. Our square knot for the next row is going to be between those two. Um, so that's going to create a little bit of a different look. Um, and that's what sort of ties that piece together. So we don't end up with long strips of square knots. It ties the whole fabric piece together, um, as in the sample. So I'm going to do one more square knot for you here, and then we'll move um, through the magic of a um, of film. We are going, I'm going to have finished all the square knots on this piece, and we're going to move on to the next knot that we're going to tie. So I'll tie this last one, the first of this row. And I think you can probably tell it may be a little bit easier if this is hanging um, and you're not having to manage like I'm doing here so that I can show you very easily. Um, you're not having to manage the fact that your piece is wiggling when it's on the ground. Hanging it up is going to be a, possibly an easier option. Um, or some people like to um, work them on their, like their leg or their knee or something like that. So this, the method of tying that square knot is identical to what we've done. We're just doing it offset um, from the previous row to create a different look. If I pull that, pull that. So you can see here are our square knots for the first row, and then this is the square knot that kind of ties those two together. Um, so I'll be back in one second with all of the square knots finished, and we'll move on to the next stitch. Now that we have finished all of the square knots in this piece, um, so we did one row that went all the way across, then one row that skipped the first two and the last two and went all the way across, then fully across, then skip the first two and the last two again. And then we did an offset row of three underneath that, two under that, one under that. And again, if you get the kit, the full pattern with all of the numbers of cords and all of that is included with it. Um, once we finished all of our square knots, so we've learned the, learned the lark's head and the square knot, that, those are the two main um, stitches in macrame. So if you've got those two, you're going to be um, going to do well with a lot of different patterns. That's going to give you a lot of the macrame skills. There are a couple more that are used pretty frequently. And so now we are going to go over one called the clove hitch. So this here is going to be the clove hitch. Let me put it here so you can see it a little bit better. So the clove hitch is going to allow you to sort of travel across your piece. You can go diagonal, you can go straight across, but you're going to be moving across your piece instead of keeping um, sort of all of your cords more in the same basic spot that they started with. Um, so let's get started with how the clove hitch works. So the clove hitch is always going to include a filler cord, just like our square knot, the two cords in the center are, are our fillers for the square knot. There's gonna be a filler for your clove hitch as well. Um, so in this case, our filler is going to be the, uh, we're going to start with that cord number one. So that very first cord is gonna be our filler and that first cord is gonna travel across our piece. And for this pattern, it's gonna travel across our piece into the center on this side. Um, and so to work the clove hitch, what we're going to do is the filler is never going to be visible. So we're not going to be able to see this cord. All of the other cords are going to wrap fully around that and completely cover it um, to give us that look. So to achieve this piece, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to be using these half at all. I just like to push things out of the way that way. I think it makes it easier for me um, to keep track of what I'm doing when I've only got the the uh, cords that I'm actually going to be working with in front of me. So we've we've laid the filler cord across the direction that it's going to go. We are going to take for this piece, we're going to take cord number two. It's going to come, it originates from underneath that filler cord. So we put the filler cord on top. So all of our cords start off underneath. Our, our cord number two, our working cord is going to come up over the top and then down through this hole. So our working cord is gonna come up and over the top of that filler cord and then go down through that hole. And then I'm just gonna tighten it up. You want to pull your filler cord tight 
and tighten the working cord around the filler cord. That way your filler cord is hidden and your working cord is what you see. And you do wanna make this fairly tight that way. Now, just like with the square knot, the clove hitch kind of has two steps. That's step number one. Step number two, we're taking our filler cord is in the exact same spot. This time we're gonna take our working cord and we're gonna go over the top of our filler cord and then we're gonna go down through this hole that's made by the filler cord. So we go over the top of the filler cord and then down through. And again, I hold my filler cord tight and I'm pulling this section tighter. So you can see this is what we're aiming for. You can see two separate knots and it looks like our working cord is coming out between those two separate knots. So that's what we're looking for. And then our filler cord is coming out the edge and continuing on the way that we're gonna take it. So that's our clove hitch. I'm gonna do a second clove hitch with our next one along um, and talk you through it again. So this pattern and when generally when you're working the clove hitch, now you're going to move to the next cord. So now we're gonna take the new strand two um, so our strand one was the first working cord. Now this is our strand two. Our filler is still laying across. We are gonna take that working cord. It starts from underneath already. We're gonna take it up and over the top and through this hole. So up and over the top and through that hole. And I hold my filler cord tight and I tighten my working cord around that. And I cinch it right up next to the previous one that I've done. So that was step one. Step two, I'm going to take my working cord, I'm going to go over the top of my filler cord and around it and back through. Hold my filler cord and pull tight. And I will kind of take my finger and sort of push it up, push up that way to make sure that there's not a long strand right there. And now you can see this up close as well. You've got your two strings, your working cords coming out between them and your filler cord comes out the other end. So this is what we're aiming for with our clove hitch. And I will go ahead and do that all the way down here. And then we're gonna do a clove hitch. So this is a diagonal clove hitch that travels from the left to the right. And once I finish this one, I'm gonna show you a clove hitch that travels from the right to the left. You're doing the exact same thing, um, but you're doing it in the opposite direction. So I just wanna make sure that that is clear as well. Okay, so I have done the clove hitches all the way across the first half of our cords so that the strand that started off as strand number one over here is now in the middle and you can't see that strand pretty much at all through, through there all the way along. Now we're gonna do clove hitches going the other direction. And as I said, it's, it's identical. You're doing the exact same thing. You're just going the other way with it. But I think it definitely can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around how that works. So we're gonna show you. So I take all of the ones that I'm not working with and push them out of the way again. This is the benefit to me of doing it flat. It can be a little awkward to work flat, um, but it lets you manage your strands a little bit more easily. So it's kind of a um, six of one, half dozen of the other kind of a situation. So we are gonna take our farthest away strand. So this would be strand number 20, because we're working with 20 strands all the way across. And strand number 20 is our filler cord this time. So we're gonna take that and lay it all the way across the direction that we're going, and we're gonna come right here to the center again with this. And so in the exact same way, we're going to take the very next strand, strand number 19 in this case, we are going to, it starts off underneath because we, we lay our filler cord across the top of all of these. So cord number 19 goes from underneath, it wraps up around and then through this hole. So it goes up and around and through this hole. And hold on to your filler cord, keep that under tension, and then you're going to be forming your knot with your working cord. So that was the first part of that clove hitch. The second part, we're gonna take our filler cord again. We're gonna go over the top of our filler cord and then come out the other side. Hold on to your filler cord 
and pull. And again, you kind of push it up, hold onto that filler cord to tighten it up. And in the exact same way, you've got two loops from our working cord and our working cord comes out between the two and then our filler cord comes this way and heads toward the middle again. So if you use the if you use words you go from the outside to the inside then you're using the identical words. You go from the outside to the inside going one direction, you go from the outside to the inside going the other direction. If you're using words like to the right and to the left then the instructions are different between the two. Um, for me personally, in my head and in the written pattern, I use words where you go from the outside to the inside. That way your hands and your brain are saying that they're doing the same motions, um, which to me works better. It makes, this, um, makes the macrame pieces easier to, to accomplish and for me to kind of wrap my head around what I'm trying to do. Um, so we are going to do that part across this way. Um, I'm going to work on this and I want to address one issue. So your filler cord goes here. We're doing the exact same thing again. Oops, sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to talk you through this one more time and then I'm going to talk about an issue when you're looking at these two stitches. They kind of look different from each other um, on one side versus the other. So to do the clove hitch on this side again, we take <clears throat> our filler cord is going across the front again. This is now cord 18. It goes underneath the filler cord. We're gonna go up and over and through this hole. Go up and over and through this hole and pull, holding onto the filler cord while you tighten it. This is where I think using multiple colors can really come in handy. It makes it really easy to keep track of what you're doing. And now we're going to take our working yarn. We're gonna go over the top of our filler cord and then through this hole. and hold the filler yarn and tighten it. You know you've done it right. If you're looking at it and you've got a bump, your filler, your working yarn comes out and another bump and then your filler cord comes down that way. So um, I wanna talk just a little bit about, to me, when I look at these, the clove hitch that comes the direction that you read starts on the left and works across to the right. These, like the bumps that are created by that knot, look more neat and tidy to me. They look a little bit crisper um, and just a little bit neater. When I work it coming this direction, they just, those, those two bumps of each color, just a little bit less defined to me. It's very subtle, um, but if you've spent a very long time staring at yarn and cords, um, you, you, you may be able to see it as well. Um, the reason that this happens is not at all that you're doing anything wrong or differently between the two sides. You're not. The reason that this happens has to do with the twist of the cord. So um, this will be a little aside for just a minute, but I promise I'll keep it short. So this cord is created by a bunch of teeny tiny strands all twisted together so they go and form your cord. Well, when we're tying the clove hitches going from left to right, the direction that we read, when we're wrapping our working yarn across, we are wrapping the same direction as the twist in our yarn. So you can see the twist in the yarn. We're wrapping this around. It's wrapping the same direction. We're putting more twist into our cord that we're using. When we're working this way, when we wrap it across, we're wrapping it and we're actually untwisting that cord. It's subtle, it's a ha like a half a turn, but we are unwrapping that and that makes our cord not be as firm and sort of stand out um, as a separate thing that sort of turns it more into all of our strings um, sort of smooshing everywhere together. So that is why you get that subtle difference between them. If you don't notice and don't care, that is totally fine. You, I am not um, a perfectionist at all. Um, and normally things like this don't bug me. For whatever reason in this project, it does bug me a little bit. So this is how I get over that. Um, when I am working on this side, so working from right to left, the opposite direction that we read, um, when I go to start, I actually prefer to take my working yarn and twist it like two twists. So I just take my fingers and go twist, twist. So now that has a little bit of extra twist. 
So now when I go to tie this knot and I take out a little bit of twist, it still has the same amount of twist as over here. You don't want to go nuts and twist and twist and twist and twist and twist because then you'll have the opposite problem. This side will look more defined and this side will look more sort of swooshy booshy. Um, but that is how I get over it. So I tie everything exactly the same. This is my filler cords going across. I go up and over and through there. And I don't, I'm not trying super, super hard to not let any of that twist out. That's why I put extra twist in because this will naturally take twist out. But I tighten it by holding my filler cord and then I do the same thing. I go over the filler cord and under and pull it through, hold on to the filler cord to tighten. And if you're looking at this, it's subtle. I can't stress it enough. It is, if it doesn't matter to you, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you notice it and it does, it bugs you, this is how you get around it. So see how these look firmer and more like two distinct bumps? And these just look a little bit flatter and a little more like mooshed together as one thing. So that's how you get this side to look more like this side, if that is something that matters to you. Um, and I will, so this is the clove hitch. This is not an uncommon stitch in macrame, but it's not a stitch that every single macrame pattern is gonna use. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and finish. I'm gonna come and do this side. And then this particular pattern has us do two rows. I'll grab this one again. So this is the finished one. Um, so this particular pattern, we do it all the way across with that first one. So with cord number one as our filler cord. And then our new cord number one, we do a second uh, time through as the second row of those clove hitches. And we do that on both sides <clears throat> before it's time to do the next one. So with the film magic, I will be back after I've completed that and we will get started on our next stitch for macrame. Now I'm going to go through how to create with macrame what is called the spiral stitch. So you can see it here. Um, it is what's going to create, you can see that how it spirals around. It's gonna create what these little dangly guys, our little tassels off the end. Um, all five across have the start of them is all that spiral stitch. You can see that spiral all around. Um, these four end with just the spiral stitch and then we do a tassel. And then this last one, we'll go over this in a separate part, how to create this part. But the spiral stitch is incredibly straightforward, especially since we have already gone over how to do the square knot. Um, the spiral stitch is just the first part of the square knot over and over again, where you don't do the second part. So um, for this particular pattern, it wants you to start with the first four, uh, chords one, two, three, and four. We're going to have, just like in the square knot, we're only going to be working with chords one and four. Chords two and three are going to be the filler chords in the middle um, that are just going to stay there. We're going to do the first step of our square knot. So we're going to take chord one, go across chords two and three, and underneath chord four. And then we are going to take chord four and go underneath chord two and three and over the top of chord one. And we are going to pull that tight. And the little bit of a trick here is because we are trying to achieve a tassel, oops, this is all tangled up here. Since we are trying to achieve an, a tassel that hangs straight down, you're gonna need to leave this stitch a little bit looser on the outside than it is on the inside. So it's going to need to be firm and snug up against the inside um, piece but it's gonna have to be a little bit looser on the other side. If you pull it totally tight on both sides, so it's as tight as it can be, these are gonna stick straight out that way, um, which for me personally is not a look that I care for as much as if they, they lay down. Um, I did play with a bunch of different ways of doing these um, uh, <clears throat> to get the look of what I really liked for this. And you can see when I make them stick straight out, I just didn't like the way that looked as much as when I made everything um, lay nice and straight. Like I just prefer the look of them laying down. So we do want to be a little bit aware of um, this outer edge here. We don't want to pull it as tight as I did there. We can just loosen things up just a little bit. 
and make sure that we're snug up against this side, but we've got a little bit of wiggle room on this side. So you can see some air there and that we've got a little bit more space there. So we can keep it like this. So we're, we're snug up against here. We've got a little bit of open space there. So the only difference now between the spiral stitch and the square knot, which we've already done, is with the spiral stitch, we're just going to keep doing that first step. So we're taking cord number one, we're going across cord two and three, and underneath cord four, and then we're taking cord four and going back underneath. So that exact same first step again. And as we tighten this up, we just wanna be aware we want it to be flat against the first part that we've already put on there. And again, don't tighten it up so that it's gonna stick straight out. Um, leave it laying a little bit more. And we're just going to keep doing that. I'm actually gonna pick this up because as the name suggests, the spiral stitch doesn't lay flat. So if I'm forcing it to be flat on this table, um, it's a little bit harder to do um, than if I let it start to spiral. So what I do is I take cord one over cord two and three, and under cord four, and then I take cord four behind cords two and three and over cord one, and I pull it this way. And you will start to see how See how this is spiraling? It's starting to turn on itself. Um, and we are going to do a fewer number of spirals. So we're gonna do four spiral stitches for the outer two and five spiral stitches for the middle two so that we keep that shape of shorter, longer, longest. Um, so we're gonna do, we've done three, we're gonna do four. So I'm gonna do my fourth one right here. just like I've done before. That's the fourth part there, kind of tighten it up. Just make everything, allow that to spiral around so you can see that spiral look to it. So now this one is done. We're gonna move over and do the exact same thing, but on the other side. So we're going to go over to and under the last one, bring that through. So that is the spiral start. And you can see I'm making it tight right against here and I'm leaving it looser on this edge. So I've done one of my four. I'm gonna do the second one. the third one oops and my hands were on autopilot and so I did a square knot instead of a spiral stitch you may do the same thing while you're working um, you can tell on this spiral stitch they're like rungs of a ladder where this edge all looks the same way, this edge all looks the same way, and there's these straight lines across. So I think this looks like a ladder. When I look at this one, I can tell, when I just look at it, this side of the ladder doesn't look the same as this side. This side has a big bump on it. That's just because instead of doing it the way that I was supposed to, I did the other half of the square knot stitch, and that created a square knot. Um, so you just take it out and do it again. So I've done the first two correctly. You can see the, the first rung of my ladder and the second rung of my ladder. So now I just need to do two more the correct way. I really didn't stage that to do it on purpose, but I think it's useful um, to, to say this is how you take it out. If this is how you tell that something went wrong um, and this is how you take it out. So I go over, I bring the first one across. That is the step that we need to make sure that we're doing. Tighten that up a little bit, and then again, bring the first one across, and then we make sure that we are doing the spiral stitch by just repeating that step over and over instead of doing the other half of the square knot. So this creates my ladder where both sides look the same all the way down, 
and that's going to want to spiral around so that now both of both of the outer two are finished. Now I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to do five spiral stitches on this set of four strands, this set of four strands, and this set of four strands. Um, and then we will be back to talk about tying tassels. Now we are ready to go over how to do tassels. So we have finished our spiral stitches on all five of our sections here. So now we're going to be doing creating tassels at the end of the four on the outside. The center one will go back to and, and finish up in a different way. But to do our tassels, we're going to get started with the dangler on the first um, that are created by the first four. I know there should be a more technical name for this, um, but I don't know what it is. So the hangy downy part. Um, and we are going to put our tassel on there. So this is what we're aiming for them to look like is we're creating these tassels on the end. So what we are going to do is we are going to, of our four cords, you'll notice that your cords will be different lengths. And this has to do with which cord is used to make which part of each stitch because one cord uses more yarn to create um, the stitch that we're doing than the other cord. So generally filler cords don't use very much yarn um, or very much of our cord um, and the ones that are actually wrapping around and going through are going to be the ones that use more cord. So that's why your cords end up different lengths at the end. Um, to actually create the tassel, it doesn't matter which of those cords you use, um, but for this piece, I do in the pattern give a recommendation um, to create the longest length of um, sort of spare uh, yarn that you trim off at the end, because that spare is what we're going to be using to create um, the, the leaf piece at the very bottom. Um, so it doesn't matter to create the stitch, but it does matter for this particular piece. I also just personally find great satisfaction in using all of the, or as much of the material as I possibly can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose the longest cord, the one that's longer than all of the other ones. And I am going to take that longest cord and I'm going to create a loop. So it's everything is going, all of my cords are going straight down. I'm just going to take that longest cord and fold it back up on itself. So I've created this little loop. I'm now going to take the second longest cord. So that would be this one. And I am going to wrap that cord around everything. So you'll notice there's four cords here. There's the two that we haven't done anything with, and then there's the top and the bottom of that loop that we've created. So you've got four cords there. We're gonna take this cord and we are going to wrap it tightly around that whole bundle. So I'm not doing anything special. I am truly just wrapping that cord. And I recommend wrapping it three times around but you wrap it around the number of times that you like the way the little wrap bundle looks. So I've got it wrapped around three times there, three times. Now I'm going to take that cord that I just wrapped around three times and I'm going to put it through this loop. Front to back, back to front, doesn't matter. Stick it through the loop. Now, and notice I do have my hand on that the whole time because it's not secured in any way. So if I were to let go, it would kind of all just, it wouldn't be tight, neat and tidy anymore. So I keep my hand on there until I get the tension sorted. So now I'm taking that cord that I put up at the beginning. The, this is the longest cord in the bundle. And I'm just pulling that and see how that makes that loop smaller. So I've got a hold of all of my cords that are in the middle and I am just pulling until that loop kind of tightens all the way up. And then you can kind of let off a little bit of your pressure on there and pull this loop as tight as humanly possible. Just pull and pull and pull, white knuckle, pull it as hard as you can. Um, and now this is secure. This um, wrap around is, is held tight with the, um, just the friction of being pulled up into the notch. These little fringy guys are going to stay straight down. The only thing we need to deal with is this. So this little guy coming out the side there doesn't look the very, very best that we want it to. So we're just going to take our snips or just regular scissors work just fine. Um, and we are going to cut flush. So that means 
I'm not gonna dig down in there to try to get it. Oops, and you'll see I've actually got a little bit of messiness on the back there. I'm actually gonna pull and tug this just a little bit more before I make that cut to make sure that I really like the way this entire thing looks. So that means pulling on each of the three cords independently to make sure that everything all the way around it is nice and neat and tidy. Because once I've cut this cord, kind of all bets are off. I can't really mess around with things very much more. Um, I might have been a little bit too aggressive when I pulled and I think I pulled this a little bit short. So I'm just, again, before I make that cut, I'm just gonna pull and tug, make sure I like the way my spiral looks. It's spiraling around nicely, looks nice from the front looks nice from the back. Everything is how I want it. Now, I'm gonna take my snips or my scissors and I'm gonna go right in and cut it flush. So I don't want to like dig down into the knot with it. I definitely don't wanna accidentally cut anything other than this one strand, but I don't wanna leave like a little nub either. I wanna cut it kind of, my, my scissors are touching the fabric there, but not digging into it at all. And I'm just gonna snip, cut it off. And that is this tassel finished, and it has left me with the longest cord that I could have uh, because this was the longest strand to start with. Um, so I'm gonna set that aside. We won't use that until um, a, another step a little bit later on, but we, we got it out now. Um, I'm also going to trim these to approximately the length that I want them. We do also want to make these fairly long, the, the cords that are in here, we want those to be fairly long cords, but we don't want to shortchange ourselves on how long the tassels are either. So we, I personally like my tassels to be about an inch long, but it is much easier to trim them shorter than it is to make them longer after you have cut it. Um, and so I generally cut them about an inch and a half. Um, I sort of use my, <laughs> my knuckle as my measurement. So I consider that about an inch. So I'm gonna cut just a little bit below that. Um, and I like to pull everything down straight um, and then cut straight across. So give yourself a little bit longer than you think you'd want your tassels. Um, because we want to have the extra that we keep to be as long as we can so that we can do useful things with it. Um, but we want to make sure that we give ourselves some extra room with the tassel. So I've got, these are all of my spare ends of my, uh, of creating that first tassel. And again, we're going to use those to create this at the end. So we're going to keep those. Um, and we have created our first little tassel here. Once you've got the tassel finished, we want to go ahead and comb that tassel out. So they make special macrame combing tools but uh, you probably already have a comb in your house and this is what I use. Um, they, so you can, you can use whatever combing device you want, um, but I, you're just going to comb. You wanna start a little bit lower down um, and work your way up into it and do make sure you're not combing out any of the ones that are not finished yet because it's a pain to work the macrame once they're all separated this way. Um, it can be done, um, but it's just easier if you only comb the one that you're finished with and not all of them. So I like to comb it from the front and from the back so that it all lays nicely. And then my personal preference is to finish everything before I trim. Um, and so this one is all the way done. I'm gonna go ahead and do tassels on the other three and then we'll come back and we will start working our center piece. Now we are going to be working the center section here. We have finished our tassels on the four outer sections, and now we're going to be working on creating this eye. So it's actually, there's actually a hole there um, uh, that we're gonna be creating. So we've already done the spiral stitch for the top. Now we're just gonna be creating this section here. So what we're going to do is we are going to start with the four cords at the very center. And one thing that the pattern makes clear, but I wanna make sure that I double talk about, is when we started with these four <coughs> cords, 
this was the first of the four chords. This was chord one, two, three, and four, or rather chord nine, 10, 11, and 12. Um, but as we did the spiral stitch, that spiral stitch, as it is well named, spirals around. And so what started off as the first chord in this bunch of four ends up as the last chord in this bunch of four, and this is the first chord. So you do want to go ahead and let that spiral happen. So this started off as the last chord in those set of four, it spiraled all the way around, so now it's the new first chord. So we do wanna let that go ahead and happen. So what we're going to do is we are gonna take these four chords, we're gonna be working just with the first two of those to start with, and if you notice, one of them is longer than the other one. <clears throat> we are going to divide that one in half, and this doesn't, like, don't count the individual number of strings or anything, just kind of eyeball it, and eh, it looks about like half, um, and just pull that apart to separate it all the way down. And if you find it a little bit easier to work with, you can put a little bit more twist, so just take your hand and twist it a little bit, but you don't absolutely have to um, if you don't want to. And those two, remember those are the longer two, those two are gonna go on the outside, and then we're going to separate the center, or separate the other one, and again, just pull it all the way down. And these are the shorter chords, and these are going to become the middle two, the filler two chords. So we're just working with these chords, and now we have four of them. They're half the size as they started with. We've got the two longer ones are the outside ones, the first and the last, and then the short, two shorter ones are the middle ones. And now we are going to tie three square knots. So we already know how to tie square knots. We are gonna go over the first two and under the last one, and then the other, the fourth chord is gonna go behind, chord two and three, and in front of chord one. And we're gonna pull that up. It's a little awkward right at the top here just because of how we divided and separated things, but we're just gonna tighten it up as best we can. And then we're gonna do the second part of that slip, or that square knot. Remember, the square knot, we do two separate sections. It's not the same as the spiral where we just do the first step over and over again. For our true square knot, now we take the fourth chord, we go over chords three and four, and under chord, or we take the fourth chord and go over chords three and two, and under chord one, and then we take chord one, go behind chord two and three, and over chord four. So that's the second part of the square knot. So we're gonna do three on this side. So I've just done one. Okay, we've finished our three square knots on th with these chords. Now we're gonna set those aside. We're going to come and do the exact same thing here. We're going to take, again, one chord's gonna be way longer than the other. We are gonna take the longest chord. We're gonna separate it in half. Doesn't have to be exact, you can just kinda eyeball it. Separate it in half. Those are going to be the first and the last chords, then separate the shorter of the two chords, sometimes they get a little bit snaggy and sort of they just want to stay connected at the bottom, just pull gently, um, they'll, they'll come apart. So we've got the chord that was the longest chord, we separated that into two sections. Those became the first chord and the last chord, the center two there. Now we're gonna tie three square knots on this one exactly the same as we did on this one. Okay, now that we have done our three square knots on one side and our three square knots on the other side, we are going to bring those back together and that is going to create the eye that we're, we're working with. So you'll notice now all of my cords are about the same length again. 
And that's because of how we, where we worked the outside ones were, those were the ones that the most is getting used up with the stitches that we're doing. And the inside ones, the fillers, did not get used very much of the length of those cords, so that brought everything back to the same length. Like I said, this is not a necessary step for standard macrame. I personally just have a thing for making um, as little waste as I can and using as much of the materials as I can do. Um, so that's how I designed this kit to work. So now that they're all the same length again, it doesn't matter which one is where, we are going to turn what is now eight cords back into four cords. We're just going to call these two as one, these two as one, these two as one, these two as one. You don't have to twist them back together or do anything like that. We're just using them, the two cords held next to each other as if they were one cord. Now we're going to tie one slip knot or one square knot. I apologize, I uh, don't know why I keep saying slip knot. One square knot um, with just these four cords. So just like a standard slip knot, we take these over the middle two and under the last one, take the last one behind the middle two and over the top of the first one. And we're gonna pull that tight. And if we pull it a little extra tight, that actually makes that eye open up a little bit more, which I kind of like the look of. I like it to be a little bit um, open, me a little bit more like a circle. If you pull it a little bit extra tight, it makes that circle open up a little bit more. And then we do the second part of our square knot. We take the fourth cord over the middle two and behind the first one, just like all the other square knots that we've done. And again, tighten this up. I think making this part as tight as possible is really, um, you're gonna like the look of it better as well. So that creates that eye that you see in, in this one as well. The last part of our, of our actual piece is going to be the feather or the leaf at the bottom. To me, they look more like leaves, but you'll see them called feathers as well. Whichever one they look most like to you is what you can call it. Um, so that will be in our next step. For the feather is our very, very last step of our macrame piece here is going to be creating the feather um, or the leaf here at the bottom. Um, to do this, we are going to be working off the cords that came from the bottom of our eye that we created here. So we are not going to cut any of these cords short yet. We are gonna leave all of these connected and this is going to be the seam in the center of our leaf and I'm going to call it a leaf the whole rest of this time because that's what it looks like to me the most. So the center here and it's actually really firm this does not have a lot of flexibility you'll see as I hold it straight out it supports its own weight it doesn't sort of flop over um, it will bend if you if you make it but it's a pretty stiff thing um, it's because there's a lot of cords smooshed up into that. So we are going to start off by you want to decide what colors and what color progression you want to happen on your leaf. Um, if you're using all the same color or you're not necessarily working from this kit so you have a, a more amount of your different colors, um, you can create the, the color layout however you want to. But for this kit, um, and how I personally just like to work when I'm doing my, um, my crafts, the options that we have for our leaf are actually the ends that we cut off as we were making all of our tassels. So the length of the center, <clears throat> the length of the center ones, as well as what we cut off here, that's our option. That's what we've got to work with um, and nothing else. So I think it makes it easier to have fewer options. Um, for me personally, all of the samples that I have made um, I have liked the look of the top of the leaf is the same color as the center eye. And then the middle color of the leaf is the middle, um, the, the middle one. And then you've got the outer one. And then you'll end with the color of the center eye. The only thing that's not negotiable is the little end part here will be the color 
of this because these are the this is the tassel these are the, the tail ends of this these cords that are here so this will be whatever color these cords are um, but everything else you get to pick what color they're going to be so what i like to do is i like to start by looking at my here's sort of all of my tails that i've got some of them are going to be obviously too small like this is too short you can't do anything with this so you can set that aside um, it is 100 percent 100 percent cotton it will compost you can throw it in your regular backyard compost bin or if you like city um, does composting it's a plant material it'll break down um, so some of them are just definitely too short what i kind of like to do is look for my longest one so I've got one or two that's way longer than all of the others. What I tend to do is fold that one in half and cut it and say, this is the length cord that I'm looking for. Um, so I tend to go through all of my pieces and cut anything else to that kind of a length. So I've got all of my... Um, sort of all of my options so it looks like I've got about and you will have some cords that hat you have more of the color so that one was too short and some you'll have less of so if I'm looking here these are all of similar length um, there are a couple that are a little bit longer so I may actually leave those couple just a little bit longer and I'm gonna cut this last really long one um, to be the same length as kind of some of the other ones. So, cut that one off. <clears throat> so if you are getting started, these are kind of the links that you're working with. What I like to do, this is my farthest out color. So this is, um, this is the tassel that's closest to the outside. That's what color that is. I personally like the way it looks if the top of my leaf is the same color as this. So what I actually want to do is take the longest length of this one and measure that against the longest length of my hanging down tassel. So if you're looking at the hanging down tassel, again, you'll have some that are a little bit longer than others, but most of them are about the same length on here. Um, so I'm just looking for the longest one. So that's going to be this guy, these two right here. And I'm just going to measure, here's my longest one here. I'm going to put it up there and like that and think to myself, okay, if I cut it this long, that's going to make the length of my feather way too short. Um, so I know I'm not going to want to cut it like that. I kind of eyeball it and look, um, look to see, I want to leave this length. If you look at them next to each other, it's easy, but obviously when you're making your own, you won't have one already, um, to work from. So what I kind of like to do is I like if I'm, if I'm starting right where the eye ends, I kind of like if I fold that up, the end of my tassel reaches basically right to the start, um, right to my dowel rod. So that's what I'm gonna recommend that you do when you're deciding how long to cut the um, these tassels. So if I fold it right here and just fold these up, this is about how long I want those. So you can actually go ahead and cut those off right there you can cut all of them um, if you want, just so that everything is all the same, all the same length. These snips cut one strand at a time much better than um, a bunch of strands all together. So these, these are the center color strands that I've got. So I'm going to just pick the longest one of these and to create the leaf look, it is incredibly straightforward. What you want to do is you want to take your strand of yarn that is going to be the sticky outy part of the leaf, like the broad face of the leaf. You want to take that piece, you want to fold it in half. You want 
to <clears throat> put uh, kind of like when we did the tassel we're going to take that bite take that like the folded part where we folded it in half we're going to lay it across what we're going around and we are tying a lark's head just like we did to attach our yarn to our dowel at the beginning so we're going to take the two little ends we're going to wrap those around we're going to go through here and we're going to pull it can be a little tricky if your um, cord that you're working with is short so you don't have tons of space to work with but we want to push that as far as we can up to the top so get it right up to the very 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 top and then pull it as tight as we can this way as well and so that is the first part of our leaf and we're going to do the same thing but going the other way so i'm going to take my next string gonna fold it in half i'm going to lay it across oops i'm actually going to lay it the other way across because we want again like we talked about at the very beginning with our larks heads we want them to all be have the, the bump on the same side it doesn't matter to me which side you think looks better as the front face of your finished piece but you will probably be happier with the result so if you see both of these the bump is not visible the bump is on the other side so if you look at the finished one the bump is not visible all the way down on this side none of them have that bump there when i turn it on to the back the bump is visible on the back on all of them so it doesn't matter which way you do it as long as you're consistent with it the whole time um, and this is one where i definitely have to take out a few and redo them because i get them the wrong way so you want to tie a lark's head with the tail pointing out to the right and to, with the tail pointing out to the left and just alternate right left right left right left all the way down so you can do as few or as many as you want of the top color the color of your eye that's right above it and then you can transition to the next one for me what i like to do is i like to do a few at the top of the eye color but just a few i just feel like visually to me it ties that leaf in better and then i like to use the one that i have the most of um, so you'll have one color that you'll have a lot more long ones of than you will of the other color. So I like to do the one that I have a lot of long ones with and then the one that I don't have as many long ones with. Um, and what this does is this is going to naturally create the shape of the, um, of the leaf where it's shorter um, and like more rounded at the top and then you've got this longer section um, that are longer and then you've got the bottom is going to be the color of that eye again um, sticking out so that is what I personally like how I like to lay mine out but you get to pick yours however you want to um, so I'm going to do two more with the eye color the the color of the the center piece that's already there um, and some of these because we've divided these in half and then put them back together some of them have a little bit of um, like they're not quite as neat and tidy as maybe we would want them to be we are going to be trimming everything down when we're totally finished so it doesn't really matter that much but if organizing them before you tie them on makes it easier for you to deal with tying them on then feel free to do that um, whatever works for you to make this work a little bit better is going to be the right way um, so i'm going to tie another one on to go this way and pull and even when you look at it and you think that's too short to go around they're not they do go around and as you pull and get things all tightened up and organized on there um, the center like um, the center backbone of this actually gets compressed down more and more so that you get more length coming out after you've tied a couple of these on what you'll actually want to do is you'll notice these look really far apart um, compared to these what we actually want to do is take the bottom and just pull up and again like hard as you can pull up and that really smushes everything a lot closer together so it takes away that like that little gap that's there 
Um, I would recommend do the same number of each of a color on each side. So I've got two that go out to the right and I only have one that goes out to the left. So I'm going to do another one that goes out to the left. And I didn't quite get that whole thing through, so that's fine. Just take it off and try again. Fold it in half. that up pull it tight pull it as tight as you can and I tend to do three or four um, on there before I pull it tight to kind of tighten that up um, but you can do it whenever you're um, feeling like it's time um, and so after I've done just basically two on each side of this color um, it can be time to go ahead and switch to the the next color the color that you have the most of and you'll see when they're longer it's much much easier to do this um, and if you uh, decide that you don't want the uh, the center color on there at the top you don't have to put it there um, it is totally and completely just what works for you so I lay that I take my strand I fold it in half I lay the bite over the top I pull my two strands through and it's much much easier when they are longer so tighten that up do the next one take your strand fold it in half lay it across pull it through and you are just going to keep doing that until you've done a couple more you're gonna take the middle piece pull it up and you can tell the pink at the top we divided these strands in half before we cut them and so these were half the size they were a full strand divided in half versus when I started in with the orange strands or with the the next color strands these were full strands because we hadn't divided these in the way that we divided this to create the eye shape if you don't care for the way it looks to switch thickness so to go from smaller pieces here to thicker pieces here um, you can divide these in half as well before you work with them. Um, so if you want to do that, and again, if something goes wrong, you tie, you accidentally tie the lark's head with the bump on the, the wrong side the, so that it's not consistent, you just grab one of the strands and pull. It's going to come straight out. It's not a, not a tricky thing. Um, so if you decide you like the way it looks better, um, to just take one of those strands and pull it in half, you can go ahead and do that. So we're going to lay it across and come this way. Lay it in half and come. Whoops, see, I was trying to do that. If I do this, it works for this side, but I don't want both of my, um, both of the sides of the leaf to come off the same place. I want this one to be over here. Well, if I twist it over there, see the bump? No place else has a bump, it's just here. So this is tied the wrong way. Um, you are gonna, you're gonna have to figure out how to make these, uh, make these work in a way that works for your brain as you're doing it. What I typically do is I'm gonna put my tails going out the way I want them to come. So I'm ready for a tail that goes to the left. So I put this tail out to the left 
And then if you want the tail to stay out to the left and there to not be a bump on the top, you actually need to put your bite underneath that backbone and pull those through. And then your tails will go out to the left and you won't have a bump there. And then you can pull these tight, tighten everything up. And you can start to get a sense of how this is going to work for you. Um, so I will be back after this is all finished um, to show you how to comb it out and do the very last step if you want to put a hanger on here to be able to hang it up. Now that you have had a chance to go ahead and tie on the rest of your lark's head to create the leaf at the bottom of your piece, um, I kind of wanted to show you before I start trimming, I want to sort of remind you again of the like the overall look that we're going for. And I wanted to show you mine before I started doing any trimming or sort of the last final tighten just so that you uh, can kind of see it looks a bit of a mess before you do the kind of the finishing pretty steps. Um, and so I just wanted you to see like it, it can look really long and scraggly and like everything is all crazy different lengths and uh, it doesn't look like it's really going to turn into the, the nice tidy looking leaf or feather shape at the bottom. Uh, but I wanted to show you that even mine look like that and these are the steps that we take to turn it into um, from the sort of the scraggly thing into something that looks like it would be a really fun uh, addition at the bottom of your macrame piece. So the last step that you need to do before you start brushing out and trimming your leaf is to make sure that you're tightening. So you can see up here how close together these pieces are. And then if you start to see down here, it suddenly looks like they're really far apart from each other. So all you wanna do is you wanna grab the tails at the very, very bottom. So these are the strands that go all the way up um, to here where we started from. We're gonna take these strands and we're gonna pull. And I want you to see how much this shrinks up because it's pretty dramatic. So I pull and pull and you can even sort of take it this way so you can really get ugh, a lot of leverage with it. And now suddenly, just with that, suddenly it looks way less scraggly and it's going to have a nicer little look to it. So you can see how much longer those tails got. Um, that's because this really got smooshed all together um, to be really, really tidy up at the top. Um, so you can look in there, you want to make sure you should not be able to see any of whatever color your eye is um, and the tails at the bottom. You should not be able to see any of that peeking through on either the front or the back um, to know that it's really all the way tight. Um, and the gaps in between one strand and the next strand should be really pretty small there. So now that we've got that done, it already looks better. Um, but before you want to start trimming anything, sort of cutting anything off, we want to uh, brush everything out. So again, there are special tools or you can just use whatever comb you already have in your house. Um, and it always is easiest to start your brushing if you start closer to the edges, closer to the ends and brush out. Um, that is making a horrible noise. I apologize. I'm going to pick it up off the ground so it doesn't keep making that squeaking noise. Um, but start closer to the tips and just keep working deeper in, um, closer to where it's attached as you go. Um, and you are going to get the best results if you do this for a while um, to really get everything untangled and truly sort of have every single strand separate from each other. Now that we've got the basic first brush out done and everything is filled in just a little bit more, now we can do our first round of trimming. And this is more of an art form than an exact science. I kind of, I personally really like the, um, the sort of artistic element of, I just attach the strands that I trimmed from the rest of this. Um, on in whatever order it feels good at the time. Um, and then I like the artistic endeavor of creating the shape that I want from that. So with this one, 
because these top strands were so much longer, I can make a shape if I want to that comes out a lot bigger here and then comes down almost more of like a heart shape. Um, and because leaves and feathers come in such a wide variety of shapes in nature, there's kind of not a wrong way to do this. Um, what I am going to recommend when you're trimming is have brushed out, um, and you noticed me flipping it over to the back side, have brushed out both sides. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, um, but you definitely want to do the brushing out first before you start um, doing the trimming. It just make sure that everything is sort of arranged um, in a sensible way and have a look at the shape that it naturally presents to you and then start less aggressive with your trimming because it is always easier to take off more um, than it is to put back um, which is not actually possible at all so mine by uh, default is going to start small at the top and then I am going to leave some of this length, not all of it, um, but some of this length, and I'm going to sort of come out wide here. Um, I choose to focus on one side first, and I'll show you um, why uh, in a minute, but I'm going to focus on just one side first. And I, again, I just want to make sure everything is going nice and straight, kind of the way that I want it to and I am going to just start trimming. Um, so trim off, if in doubt, trim off less than you think you need. Um, and just play with it a little bit. Um, you can always trim off more, and honestly, you can trim off some now and then hang it up, and if you decide in a week you'd like to trim off more, you can do that. Um, there is nothing that says that the first trim that you do um, it has to be the only trim that is here. And so I am going to the trim. I need to get some extra length off of here. I don't, um, I'm not going to like it if this, this middle part stays this much longer than everything around it. So I can do a little bit more aggressive trimming um, just because I know that I'm going to want that. Um, and now I'm going to want um, kind of a, a, I'm going to want this length to sort of merge a little bit seamlessly into this one. So I know I'm going to start to need to take off a little bit of extra length there. And so I'm just going to kind of hold this up and start with the full length of this one. Kind of just trim out this way. that um, you are going to make tons of little pieces here so if you've got a tray or want to do this outside or just be prepared to sweep your floor afterwards um, so I'm getting closer here this is still a little bit too aggressive and I want to bring this part a little bit more in line with here so I am going to go ahead and take quite a bit more off of the top here and I find it easier to do this picking it up um, I find my scissors cut a little bit better and I just feel like I've got a little bit more control if I pick this up and obviously it's not all of the intermediate steps are not perfect um, but I am I'm starting to see my shape at the top here that I kind of like um, so before I keep cutting so that I know that this is not definitely the final shape that I want to it, but it's getting in the neighborhood. It's got a little bit of a slope there. I'm going to trim this part and then I'm going to go back. So I know that this is going to sort of come down um, just with gravity and we want the, um, the tip of our leaf is going to be formed by the pink at the bottom. Um, and so we know that this gap is going to need to sort of close up a little bit. And so we're going to want that same transition that we had a kind of a smooth transition from here to here. We're going to want that same thing here. And again, you can certainly trim the bottom um, as well. So I'm going to kind of do the same sort of thing. Um, and I just divide the bottom in half because I prefer to work on, um, on half of it first. And it doesn't have to be exactly perfectly divided in half. I just kind of eyeball it. Um, but get, get <clears throat> the main shape kind of go in there. 
and I'm this part kind of sticks out funny so I'm going to pick that up and trim that also and then in the middle here and eh, that that bottom part still sticks out funny um, so trim this even a little bit more and then come up this way and it's starting to get longer here as we reach up into this part okay and I'm starting to get basically the shape of the leaf that I like so far on here I'm starting to get that shape um, and this there's just kind of you just trim until you are happy with until you think you're about happy and then we'll comb out that side again so I still think this needs I want to um, make this part a lot shorter so it goes it creates a smoother transition between these two Okay, and I think I'm getting pretty close to this half being what I like. So I'm gonna take my comb again and I'm gonna comb that out. And I'm kinda this time gonna focus more on the like making it perfect, making it exactly how I want it. And I'm also gonna think about how this is going to hang. Um, so uh, gravity, gravity works. Um, and gravity is gonna make this hang sort of down as it goes along here so I'm going to work with that a little bit and I'm gonna <clears throat> even hold it up a little bit so that I can see that shape um, sort of how much gravity gravity is gonna bring that down as it's hanging um, and I am pretty pleased with the um, with the basic shape that I've got here on this side and so what I'm going to do now you can do this one of two ways um, you can take a piece of paper oops, you can take a piece of paper and slide it under the half that you have done you can, oops, you can see that I've used this paper as a, uh, as part of another project that I was doing. Um, so slide that underneath right at the halfway point and then take a marker and trace around. That gives us the basic shape so that if we, and you are gonna need to flip that over. So you draw it on one side, but obviously the other side is the mirror image of that. So you actually, you just wanna do this on a piece of paper where you will be able to see that, um, that outline through on the other side. So flip that over, put the other side down, and it's, it's very hard to see here on screen. I can actually see it okay in real life but if it's hard to see on screen um, or just for your own peace of mind as you're doing this in real life, just go ahead and trace it um, on the other side as well. And if I hold it up to the light, I can see I messed it up a little bit um, when I was tracing it. So I sort of corrected, um, corrected that trace line. So just trace it on the other side. So now it's really bold and easy to see. And now you can make your other side match. Line everything up. Remember the center point, when I was tracing on the other side, I lined that right up with the, um, the firm core that we've got going here. So that is what we wanna do here. Line everything up with that. And then take our snips and we're just going to um, give it a haircut try to cut approximately along the line um, as you shift and move things to actually do the trimming obviously things are going to move just a little bit as you work with this 
Um, so just like on the other side, if in doubt, leave it a little bit longer. Um, you can always go back and trim down more. It is very difficult to add them back again if you cut off too much. Um, so <clears throat> you can see here, got the center part here and the center part here. And I am going to um, just trim as I'm going. And just use this for reference to trim all the way up. The trace the shape um, option is a good one and will certainly get you started to get the basics um, matching, but it's not going to, there's going to be some variation um, between your two sides and it can be, that's not an exact um, replica, it's just you can't keep it all lined up perfectly to get it exactly right. Um, and so after you've gotten the basic shape from that tracing option, we want to comb comb it out again and then um, we're going to want to do some fine tuning. Um, I intentionally left it a little bit longer in some of these parts because I want to show you the other method um, for doing this which is more what I tend to do. Um, my thought is always that if I wanted it to look like it was made by a machine, I would have bought a machine made one. Um, and so I never mind a little bit of um, sort of a more organic look. That's code for I'm not a perfectionist and I don't care if both sides are exactly the same. Um, so what I typically do when I am doing mine um, is I'm actually going to fold it along this center line. Once I have one that I one side that I know I like, I'm going to fold it along this center line. So I create my own template right there. And now I'm going to trim both sides at the same time. It is really important when you're doing this that you make sure you have that center backbone totally straight. Um, if you have it off set sideways, one side is going to be significantly longer than the other, which is not what you want. Um, and so if you're feeling a little unsure doing it that way, you can always um, do a small cut and then lay it down flat and see um, if you're happy with how that's, how that's going. Um, so when I'm doing the second method where you're not using the, the tracing idea, I lay, make sure that this is totally flat and not turn this way or that way, um, totally flat. And I am just going to trim up this way. So, and it's okay if you trim both sides because both sides will, um, both sides will be, will be part of this and then both sides will be the same. Um, so it's fine if you're getting both sides in there. So I'm just going to trim this way and show you again in a minute. Okay. So that was my um, sort of doing it in on the fly um, just casually and I'm gonna brush this back out I decided switching to uh, holding it up in front of me the way I normally would do it was gonna work better for me so um, hello I'm big again <laughs> <clears throat> And so you're going to want to go ahead and comb this out. And again, I'm making a giant mess all over my floor because I'm just cutting this straight to how, um, how it is um, to do this outside or over a trash can. Um, or know that you're going to wash your floor when you're done. So you just are going to keep playing, um, playing with it until you like the look of it. And you can make your leaf significantly smaller than this. Yours does not have to be um, this large. I personally like the look of the really, really large leaf, but you're kind of seeing as I am doing this, it, I'm having a hard time getting my leaf to stay sticking straight out, which is the look that I like. Um, I, I like it to um, sort of fully support itself outwards. So I may end up needing to trim off quite a bit more before I get 
the absolute final look that I like. Um, and especially with the short little guys up here, I may end up um, trimming trimming off quite a bit more. Um, I will show you the finished look at the very end. Um, but what I wanna do is go over the very last part, which is putting your decorative hanger on. I finished trimming and fluffing my leaf uh, to the point that I'm happy with the leaf down below. Um, and like I said, you can keep uh, keep playing with that <clears throat> if you hang it up and decide that you uh, want to want to make some other changes. Nothing is set in stone, so you can um, enjoy it in in whatever form you start with, and then trim it to a different shape if you decide that you'd like a different one at another time. The last thing before our project is totally complete is going to be attaching a hanger if you choose to hang it up from a hanger um, you can depending on how you're going to use this um, you can leave it just with the stick so you can see a lot of these um, i just have on uh, sort of brackets that are sticking out so it depends on how you're going to display your piece. But if you wanna be able to hang it from the dowel, which is probably the most common way, um, the first thing that you can do is go ahead and take, um, right at the beginning, I chose to put rubber bands on the two ends, just so that I was as I was working, the piece wasn't, I wasn't worried about it falling off. Um, so I pull those off and you can see that's not really a thing that happens. It doesn't, um, it doesn't really come off as you're working, but when you're pulling and tugging on it a little bit more, it can just make you feel a little bit extra safe um, if you've got those on there. Um, and now you, um, in our kit, we included an undyed piece of macrame cord. Um, you can use whatever uh, piece of string cord, um, yarn, whatever you would like to use uh, to hang your piece. And you've got almost an infinite number of ways to attach it. Um, you can attach it on the outside, um, or if you're worried about maybe that falling off of the edges, what I choose to do is I actually go through <clears throat> the second one from the end. So my favorite way of attaching this is to go in one lark's head knot that we put on here from the edge, separate that to make that hole just a little bit easier to get it to go through. Um, and I like to make sure that um, it's go there's going to be a more visible knot on one side than the other. I prefer that more visible knot to be on the wrong side, the not the pretty side, the front side. So you want to look at it and make sure which side is the pretty side. <laughs> um, for me, I like the way that the lark's head look at the top without bumps. And I like the way that the leaf looks without the bumps as well, as opposed to the side with the bumps. So to me, this side is the pretty side. So I am going to, and anytime you've, you've cut your, uh, your cord, you're always gonna have the end is gonna start to fray apart. So as you're doing this, you can tighten, you can just add a little bit of twist to that to make that um, a little bit more firm again. So looking at the pretty side, and that is whichever side you think is the prettiest, um, you are going to take the end of your cord that you wanna use to hang it from, and you're gonna push that end through just right inside that first, first lark's head. So you've got the short little tail, sticks up the other side, and the long edge goes this way. I then like to take that short edge, take that short edge, wrap it around the front, of that so it gives you that little lump detail again and then pass that through itself again on the back so if I'm looking from the back I have taken my tail I have wrapped it around the long piece that's hanging up and I'm taking it through itself on the back. So you're basically tying an overhand knot. And then you're just gonna tighten that up on the back. So tighten it up. Looks nice from the front. You've just got that one little bump. Looks nice and tight from the back. And now I'm just going to tie another overhand knot on the back. And if you leave 
your tail just a little bit longer than I did, um, or if you pull it just a little bit more, that's gonna be easier to pull it through. Um, it's also easier to pull it through if you, again, twist that so that you're not dealing with a cord that's splitting into a bunch of pieces. But then I'm just doing, just tying, make a loop, push it through the loop, and pull the tails out through the back and tighten that up. If you don't get it absolutely perfect, where you have a couple of little ones that are sort of trapped in the knot itself, that's why I like to do it on the back. So from the front, it looks like this, looks all neat and tidy. You just have the one little, um, little thing there from the back, you have the little fringe that's just hanging down. Um, so it's not unattractive. Um, it's That's just how it's gonna look. And then we do that exact same thing on the other side. We separate that lark's head right from the end. We just push it over just a little bit so this hole is a little bit larger. That's gonna make this end a little bit easier to pass through. I'm gonna take that end, I'm gonna tighten it, just twist it just a tiny bit so it's easier to get through that hole. I'm gonna start from the pretty side of my work and I'm gonna push it from the pretty side through the little hole so that, that tail comes out the back side. And I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to take that shorter tail. I'm gonna make my tail a little bit longer this time so it's easier to tie that knot. You can always trim the extra at the end if you want to. So I take that tail, I bring it from the back where it is right now around the front to give that nice little finished um, lump there that makes it look like it's on purpose. And then I'm going to take the tail and pass it through itself again. Pass it through this way. So I just tied an overhand knot. That's what it looks like from the front. This is what it looks like from the back. I'm going to pull that. At this point, this is how you determine how long the hanger is. So if you want your hanger to be a little bit shorter, you pull this part a little bit more. If you want your hanger to be a little bit longer, you um, pull it the other way. But do leave yourself enough on this side to easily tie that knot. So again, looking at it from the front side, we wanna make sure that we still have that neat and tidy little knot there. And now looking at it from the back side, I am gonna twist it just a little bit. I wrap it around and pass it through that loop. And snug that right up against the dowel. Pull everything tight. Make sure to kind of tuck everything away and then you can push the two large heads that we kind of separated out a little bit, push those back together again. So you've got your hanger. This is my preference for how to do it, but there, like I said, if there is a different look that you would like, or you'd like to use a different cord, um, secure it on the edges here. There's a bunch, a bunch of different ways to do. Um, but I like, you can see the little, um, the little lump up here. I just think that makes it look like it's finished and intentional. And then I don't think it looks bad from the back with the little tassels hanging down. Um, I, you don't want to trim these super, super short just because it's not going to be um, all that secure if they're really, really short. Um, but you can trim them a little bit more even if you um, are going to be able to see some of the back um, of, your, of your piece. So this is your finished piece. Um, you can hang it up and then if you decide you'd like to trim things or just straighten things out a little bit more as you're working on a macrame piece, it's always gonna get a little bit, like your little tassels and, and hangy things get a little bit crooked. So just use your hands and uh, sort of twist and pull them until everything is laying straight and you like the way everything looks. I probably will go ahead and trim my leaf 
a little bit smaller. I just think the the um, proportions are a little bit wrong. And I'll probably also trim these. Remember when I when we cut these, I said cut them a little bit longer than you want them. Um, and then once the whole thing is done and you've had a chance to sort of live with it for a little bit, um, you can trim them to the length that you want. Um, always leave everything bigger than you want it. <laughs> I mean, you can always take some off. Um, you can even, if you decide, I think this section may be a little bit longer than I want it to be. So I may just pull off the bottom couple of these as well. Um, but have a look at, um, at the end of this video and I'll make sure to get a picture up there of my totally finished one hanging someplace with a nice uh, solid background so you can really see the piece. I hope this was helpful and that you enjoyed it and got something out of it um, and that you are inspired to try making your own macrame sampler piece. Um, again, you can get the kits to do these exact same um, this exact same style with the full pattern um, and the different colors. We do have three different color ways of that um, available on our website, nomadyarnshop.com or on our yarn truck that travels around uh, mostly Indiana, but all over the Midwest. And I will see you for our next project.